welcome you all here to our Earth Week lecture and to introduce our esteemed uh, presenter, Dr. Barbara Rossing, whose address is titled On Earth as in Heaven, Biblical Ecology for an Eco-Reformation. Today's lecture is supported and sponsored by Sustain Gets, which is an initiative, a group uh, here at Garrett Evangelical focused on promoting ecological consciousness and sustainable practices throughout the life of the seminary and the many publics that we serve. We have been quite busy this year as a group working on an internal environmental audit and now turning to a long-range strategic plan as part of our certification with the Green Seminary Initiative. And with the launch this fall of an ecological regeneration concentration, as well as a $10 million Hope for Creation campaign to support a new center, a faculty chair, campus greening initiatives, and student scholarships for an eco cohort, you could say that we are striving for something like an eco reformation. Wow, yes. Now, three years ago, we invited one of Dr. Rossing's colleagues at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago, Dr. Richard Perry, to address our community on the intersections of environmental and racial justice perspectives. It's not an accident that we keep inviting LSTC faculty to campus, particularly around the time of Earth Week. Beginning with theologian Joseph Sittler's mm -hmm, tenure mm -hmm. in the early 70s, and then biblical scholar David Rhodes's from the late 80s onward, LSTC faculty have been leading the way on matters of religion and ecology within various academic disciplines, in theological education, alongside pastors and denominational bodies, and ultimately, for the sake of the healing of the earth and justice throughout the land. For almost 25 years now, Dr. Rossing has been contributing and building upon this important legacy at LSTC as professor of New Testament and as a globally recognized scholar, preacher, and public intellectual. Rossing received her BA from Carleton College, I have one alum here, her MDiv from oh, Yale Divinity School, and her PhD from Harvard University. She has served as a congregational pastor, director of global mission interpretation, pastor at Holden Village Retreat Center, and chaplain at Harvard Divinity School. She lectures and preaches widely, globally, and has served on the executive committee and council of the Lutheran World Federation. Her media appearances have included CBS 60 Minutes, the History Channel, National Geographic, Living the Questions, and numerous print and radio interviews. Among her many publications, let me lift up The Rapture Exposed, The Message and Hope of The Message of Hope in the Book of Revelation, The Choice Between Two Cities, Poor Bride and Empire in the Apocalypse. Two volumes of the New Proclamation Commentary and numerous articles and book chapters on apocalyptic and ecology. Dr. Rossing, your work and the work of your seminary have been a source of inspiration that has opened up intellectual, vocational, and institutional pathways for many of us who have followed. We are thrilled to have you here, eager to continue learning from you and committed to partnering with you in the great work ahead of ecological reformation. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here at Garrett. And um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm quite envious of your $10 million campaign and your center and everything else. So hope I can come up here again when it's, it's all underway. It's, it's very exciting. Um, we are partners in the Association for Chicago Theological Schools and other consortia, the Green Seminary Initiative. Um, as you said about David Rhodes, I would also say about your emerita, um, Rosemary Ruther, 
who, along with David Rhodes, did so much ecologically back in the day, years ago, and now Tim is picking up this legacy. I want to start with sharing with you this image from this Sunday's Gospel text in the lectionary. As you said, I am a preacher. I'm preaching Sunday. I assume many of you are. But it's just an example of how we could start almost anywhere in the Bible and find something with ecological overtones. This is the image of Jesus as the vine from John chapter 15, um, painted in a Greek Orthodox icon. And I'm passing around um, a copy of this that I own that I got down at Jacob's Well in Nablus in the Holy Land. So you can see it and, and hold it. And people, when they look at it, say, I want to be part of this vine. It's a funny looking picture. It's Jesus as the omphalos, the vine. And, um, and then up in the tree branches are his disciples, almost like they're in little tree swings. <laughs> and um, their names are given, but you don't have to worry about that. But the important thing is to see yourself as one of these up in the tree branches. Jesus is the vine. You are the branches bearing fruit. And God is the Georgos, it says at the very top. Um, God is the gardener. So let me just start with asking that question. What if God really is the gardener of the world? This is the actual the subtitle of a new commentary on the Gospel of John by Margaret Daly Denty in the Earth Bible series that I'm also part of. And this is what I work on with ecological hermeneutics. Many volumes now are out in this Earth Bible series. And now we're doing individual books of the Bible. But she takes as her subtitle, Supposing Him to Be the Gardener. This is from the John 20 appearance of Jesus to Mary Magdalene. And we think Mary's mistaken. You know, she sees this guy who talks to her, who says her name, and she supposes him to be the gardener. And we think, oh, no, it's actually Jesus. But the title of this commentary and the whole reading of it from an ecological perspective is what if Jesus really is the gardener? And what if we're really living in God's garden. What would that look like? What does it say about resurrection then and about everything about caring for creation? And looking further back in the Gospel of John, what if we read that also as the lens for understanding things like abundant life in John 10.10, 10, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. What if that can help us ecologically now in this urgent moment to figure out what is true abundance if it's not the um, abundance that our culture, our extractive capitalist culture is teaching us that devours the whole earth? What if abundance is something else? So I'm starting with John 15 only because it's the text for this Sunday, but we could start with so many other texts. In the Gospel of Matthew, the title I gave this lecture, On Earth as in Heaven, that's from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. That's the Lord's Prayer where we pray every Sunday for God's kingdom to come on earth as in heaven. You could start certainly with the Hebrew Bible. In fact, I'm going to do that. Um, so many, I brought a whole pile of books here because, you know, they all fit in the car. So <laughs> Ellen, Ellen Davis is one of my favorite Hebrew Bible scholars, has a wonderful book called Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, where she looks at the Hebrew prophets through this lens of agrarianism and does a wonderful reading. Um, and I'm going to argue today that we can even look at the book of Revelation ecologically. That's my field, so that's, to no surprise, what I'll be talking mainly about. I think it can be profoundly important ecologically, the book of Revelation, and all the apocalyptic texts in Jewish and Christian literature. But I will say that what's important in my view is to begin with an image of generosity, which is what I think this vine image is from John 15. Begin with an image of beauty of love, of the amazing goodness of this whole created world. Here I'm quoting Joan Ch Chittister and Rowan Williams in their new little book called Uncommon Gratitude, Alleluia, for all that is. They write, the beginning of all our stories and the stories of planets and protozoa and dinosaurs is generosity. None of this needed to be. God wanted it so out of the impulse of love and the creation, the amazing generativity of this world, this beautiful world we live in, is all about generosity. So as I talk today, start by holding in your mind's eye, whether this icon or a favorite place that you love to go to, the sound of the place, the, the streams, 
the bird song or whether it's the beauty of Lake Michigan, which I'm always struck by when I drive up. It's, it's so incredibly beautiful. Or if it's your April daffodils or whatever, hold in your mind's eye something of beauty and goodness and generosity about God's created world. And what it's important to start with also is to say that God calls it all good. This is the refrain six times in Genesis 1. God calls it Kitov. God is looking out over the creation. It's, it's wonderful to start with this whole idea that God sees it and is almost sort of surprised at how beautiful planet Earth and the whole universe are. It's, it's almost like the astronauts looking back and, um, and seeing it. And God looks at this beauty and says, Kitov, how good. God saw how good it is with each element of creation. And the New Common English Bible, I guess I didn't bring that in my book pile, the New Common English Bible I think makes a wonderful move in translating it. Not God saw that it was good, which is how we have it in the NRSV and the RSV, but God saw how good it was. And that's because the Hebrew ki tov, ki can be either how or that. And, um, and I think that reading of God saw how good it was. God saw just how good it was is wonderful. And then there's some rabbis who suggest even that we could translate tov as beautiful. So you almost could say God saw how beautiful it was. Now, of course, Genesis 1 is not science. We at LSTC have the Zygon Center for Religion and Science. I assume in your new ecology center you'll be doing science. It's really important to lift up the work of scientists because it's scientists who are teaching us the most urgent things about climate change now. They almost function analogous to how the prophets did in ancient Israel. They are our prophets who are giving us the urgent wake-up call and um, asking us to listen to their voices before it's too late. So, um, and, and the science of evolution, the science of, of so many things is so important to how we do our work. So Genesis 1 is obviously not science, yet it is amazing. Some of the scientific aspects of it, um, how, how prescient Genesis 1 is well in advance, especially about the interrelationship of all the creatures. Because when God finally calls it all very good, which we sometimes think, oh, that happens after humans are created. We're called very good. But no, it's the entirety of the whole thing, how it all holds together, the interrelationships that are what God calls very good. And indeed, as part of the generativity of the creation itself in the Genesis 1 account, the earth and the waters become co-creators with God. This is really interesting from an evolutionary standpoint. It's exactly right that God says, let the waters bring forth new creatures. And the waters themselves do bring forth more creatures. And same with the earth. Let the earth bring forth. So earth and waters are all participants. And then it's the whole interrelationship that every, of everything that God calls good. Now, a really interesting thing that Norman Hobble, who's kind of the giant of ecological hermeneutics, in his book, um, in the, the Earth Bible Commentary on Genesis, he takes this phrase, ki tov, how good, and notes that it's almost like God is a mother who sees this newborn child, Earth is God's newborn child, and then se sees how beautiful this newborn is. And Hobble makes that connection because it's the very same phrase that Moses' mother says of her newborn child when Moses is born. She saw how good he is, how beautiful he is. And then she decides she cannot let him perish. This beautiful newborn child has to be saved. And let's think about God in that situation right now, in this moment seeing our beautiful planet, our beautiful universe, how beautiful it is, and very concerned that it's in danger and wanting it to be saved. Now, these are all just metaphors, of course. So, you know, some use the metaphor of the earth as an ark. I'm just playing around now with this idea, okay, what if God is putting us somehow in a basket to save us? What will that look like? And how is that urgent love of God so longing to save this world. What shape does that take in our lives and in our churches and in our seminaries? 
so that parallel with Moses' mother then takes us to the second thing that I want to say, which is the importance of the exodus and liberation tradition when we talk about ecology. I approach ecological hermeneutics and biblical ecology from the lens of liberation theology and empire critical interpretations of the Bible. That would be the idea that this world is ill and it didn't just catch a cold or something like that, but it's the world is ill because it's being oppressed by evil systems and unjust forces, the pharaohs of this world, starting with the Exodus narrative in Egypt. The biblical authors know how to diagnose the planetary sickness that we have, that the world has had, that the ancient biblical um, communities had. And more often than not, they call this sickness empire. Of course, it's more than that. I mean, it's, but it, it's sin, it's everything. But they see that the structural sin of what oppresses the world and its communities often are the unjust, greedy empires of the world. And I think this is especially important to say because sometimes people mischaracterize or caricature uh, ecologically oriented um, people as tree huggers or you only care about polar bears. Nothing could be further from the truth. Working on ecology and environmental justice is all about justice. It's all about liberation. It's thinking about issues of hunger and food insecurity, people in the world whose food supply is threatened. It's thinking about land and justice for marginalized communities, indigenous communities, many others whose land has been stolen. It's thinking about our relationships to our rivers, our watersheds, the waters that should be free of uh, money, of cost to people, yet more and more the waters of the world are being privatized by unjust corporations. It's thinking about access to clean air, healthy food. Environmental thinking is thinking about women and children because these poorest and most vulnerable people are the ones who are first to suffer the consequences of climate change. We know when women in Africa and other places have to walk longer and longer distances to find water for their families, they're at more and more risk of being attacked and um, assaulted. So it's all about people and communities. And it's about refugees. Many climate scientists point out that the Syrian refugee crisis and other places are at least in part caused by desertification and climate change and deforestation and that people having to leave their farms and move to cities causes tremendous instability globally. It's about refugees, not just in Syria, though, but also here in the United States. Now we've got two U.S. indigenous village communities who are losing their homes because of climate change. These are the first climate refugees in this country, although there are many others in the world. Ile de St. Charles in um, Alabama, the Choctaw people, and then in Alaska, the village of Shishmarif and a number of others. These join hundreds of thousands of climate refugees around the world whose villages, through no fault of their own, these are the people who have done the least to cause climate change. They're burning the least amount of fossil fuels, but they're having to leave their island homes because of what we're doing to the planet. So this link between justice issues and environmental issues is an important one to make, and I would argue that um, it's also right there in the Bible. It's being made that by biblical authors. Um, here I use a framework suggested by Brazilian liberation theologian Leonardo Boff, who says the cry of the earth in Romans 8, you know, creation groaning in travail for liberation, should be linked to the cry for people, for justice for people, and the cry of the poor in the biblical book of Exodus. Here's the quote. Both discourses, that is Romans and Exodus, have as their starting point a cry, the cry of the poor for life and beauty in Exodus, and the cry of the earth groaning under, under oppression in Romans 8. Both seek liberation. In Boff's view, now is the time to bring these two discourses together. Parallel cries can be seen at the heart of the message of the Bible, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, and I'm even going to argue at the heart of the book of Revelation. Now, to be sure, none of these authors 
are environmentalists in the modern sense of the word. Nevertheless, it is striking that they have an astute critique sometimes of the abuses of empires that even include things like mining and deforestation because apparently this was already going on in the ancient world, apparent, uh, albeit not to the extent we have it now. I mean, you didn't have bulldozers to bulldoze things, but you could nonetheless cause great trauma to the earth. Um, so environmental historians such as um, J. Donald Hughes, who's written a book on environmental destruction in the ancient Roman world that I use, they point out that some of the same problems of exploitation we have today of waters, of, um, of the earth through mining, some of them, and it's certainly deforestation, were familiar problems in the ancient Roman world. And we see that, for example, with the numerous Bible passages that talk about the cedars of Lebanon being chopped down, for example. Already in 1 Kings, you've got a plan by King Solomon to engage in a sort of globalized um, trading treaty with Lebanon to, send, uh, to conscript slaves, so enslaved people send 30,000 laborers north to Lebanon to chop down the cedars of Lebanon, and um, the King Solomon's going to trade Israel's grain for this. So you see this kind of commoditization of the food markets and tied to deforestation and extractive, um, well, we can't call it capitalism, I guess, in the Bible, but extraction <laughs> and injustice w going way back in the Bible. And I would say that the book of Revelation can help us as well. Now, I know this is tricky um, because revelation can be used for just about anything. Um, as Tim said, I write about the rapture and um, sort of goofy and pr very problematic readings of revelation. Um, there was another claim just last week that um, April 23rd, I guess that was this week, this Monday, the world was going to end um, because of some planet. And I, the, when I've been on these television appearances that you talked about, it's always in response to somebody who thinks the rapture is happening if not May 11th, 2012, then um, some other date. So it's, Revelation is open to very problematic interpretations, and it's a book with a long and complicated interpretive history. And we need to acknowledge that the ecological legacy of Revelation is not good, maybe even more problematic than good, but ambiguous, let's just say. <laughs> but what I'm going to try to do is to reclaim it. And I'll say the reason why is um, because of what one of my professors said to me about 30 years ago when I was looking for a dissertation topic. I had um, been a geology major at, at Carleton College. I say that I basically majored in field trips. That was the whole, <laughs> <laughs> the whole great thing about geology is you were always going out in the field. And then when I switched to New Testament studies, because I love the Bible, I figured there was no way to find an ecological topic in the New Testament. Um, so, and plus I thought I was really old because I was in my 30s. I had been a pastor for a few years and um, didn't go straight on to graduate school. So I thought I should just go to my professor and say, give me a topic and tell me what to do and I need to do it as fast as possible. So I did. I went to Helmut Kester and um, said, what, what am I going to write my dissertation on? And he said, well, I don't know. You have to write on something you love. And I said, no, no, just give me a topic. <laughs> I, actually, I had gotten that advice from one of his former students, just do whatever he tells you. Okay, I was trying to do that. And he said, no, you've got to do something you love. And then I said a really stupid thing, I guess. I said, well, I'm not sure what I love is in the New Testament, which is terrible for a New Testament scholar to say. So he said, well, what do you love? And I said, I love ecology. And he said much to my surprise, he said, I think you should work on the New Jerusalem vision at the end of the book of Revelation. And you know what I said then? I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> this, I mean, it's terrible to admit, but this was the 80s. Very few Lutherans, in fact, zero Lutherans worked on the book of Revelation. I mean, it was a, this ridiculously problematic book. Somehow we had this idea, even though it came in the lectionary. I mean, it comes in Eastern Sea, right? I just never preached on it, <laughs> never really read it, I guess. And we had this idea that if we don't bring up Revelation, other people will just ignore it also. And how, um, <laughs> that was, of course, um, terrible. But when I went to read it then, it just came to life as this amazingly earth-centered vision of God's future for our world in Revelation 21 and 22 um, of a 
paradise-like vision for the city right in the midst of our world with a river of life flowing right through the midst of that city and on either side of the river the trees of life tree of life on both sides and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations it's incredible it's wonderful and then as I read back further in Revelation though it's from 21 and 22 back into 17 and 18 what I saw is that this city, the New Jerusalem, is carefully set in contrasting parallelism to the Babylon vision, which is John's description of the Roman Empire and all empires. So that what the book of Revelation, in effect, does in these two closing visions is set before us contrasting trajectories. That's why my first book, my dissertation, was called The Choice Between Two Cities, that it's two different possible future trajectories the one very dangerous and evil, very problematic, that's the trajectory the Roman Empire is on. And then the other is this possibility of God's new Jerusalem, this beautiful world vision. And I think what John is saying in Revelation is he's trying to give a wake-up call or a warning to people that the world is spinning out of control. The trajectory that you're on is dangerous and problematic, and this is an urgent moment. You need to get off that train and get on to this other path. And that's then why he has all these fantastically terrible, nightmarish scenarios um, with mutant, multi-headed creatures and everything else. These are images of how dangerous the Roman Empire's path has become. And all of nature participates in this crying out in warning about what the future is going to hold if you continue on the same path. And it's all set within a framework of dueling eschatologies. So that's what I want to talk about now. It's all about eschatology. Eschatology and ecology go together because it's all about how we imagine the future, how we imagine an alternative, how we envision scripture's call to us as a call into a different kind of future. Um, so here's how I'm going to do this little slideshow. Um, I was fortunate to go to graduate school at Harvard at a time when a couple of scholars were working on this whole question of empire and eschatology. But when I was in seminary, so this, go back to the 70s, you know, 10 years earlier, when I was at, in seminary at Yale Divinity School, I'm sorry to say we thought eschatology was a joke. In fact, we had a humorous student publication satirical that we called Eschatology Today. I still have some copies of it. <laughs> and the motto of our little student publication was all's well that ends. <laughs> we just, you know, you just couldn't think about the end of the world and eschatology. Lutherans weren't thinking like that. But I'll never forget the New Testament class at Harvard then, 10 years later, that opened my eyes to the relevance of eschatology in terms of empire. We were reading an article by Dieter Georgi, a German scholar, on Revelation 18 that claimed that the Roman Empire had an eschatology of its own. And that eschatology of the Roman Empire was that Rome was eternal. It was going to last forever. And it wasn't just eternal, it was all-encompassing spatially as well as temporally. It owned the entire Mediterranean world. The ends of the earth meant basically the ends of the Roman Empire, and Rome laid claim to everything. So I'm going to show you a few slides of Roman eschatology that I've been working on. This is, um, don't tell anybody, because I haven't published this yet, but I guess, uh, this is the column of Trajan right in the center of Rome. And this is the most amazing eschatological monument of all, I think. Trajan was an empire just em emperor just at the turn of the first to the second century, so a little bit after most of the books of the New Testament, although maybe not the latest ones. But um, he went on big wars of conquest up into modern day Romania, um, called Dacia at the time. And when he came back, he's celebrating his conquest by putting them in a spiraling relief set on this column, 163 panels spiraling upward in this sort of endless narrative of conquest that includes all kinds of chopping down of trees and everything else. So Trajan's column makes these kind of eschatological claims. The only reason it survived into modernity is that Christians, when they you know, became the empire, then they put a statue of St. Peter on the top instead of Trajan. <laughs> so, um, but it's still there. It's this amazing monument. 
Um, but Roman imperial theology all over the place. So this is a monument at Rome called the Arapacus that shows Rome's vision of itself. So everything I'm going to show you now is Roman propaganda. Okay, these are Rome's billboards with Roman claims for how the empire works. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. In fact, what Georgi argued in this article is it's false. And what all the New Testament authors are doing is saying no to these visions. Okay, so in Rome's vision of itself, it's this kind of bucolic, full of nature kind of scene. Once Rome is conquered everywhere, then you've got Roma as the goddess with Romulus and Remus and all this Roman fertility. You've got scenes of vines and, um, and much more. And this is on an altar of peace that Augustus set up after he had done numerous conquests because it's this vision of Roman peace that is peace through conquest, peace through victory over other countries and peoples. So this is a, um, a scene many of us use. You probably use it, Kiki, and everybody else. But it's called the Gemma Augustea. It's actually a little cameo in the Vienna Museum. Um, but m classic scholars tell us it's probably a copy of an image that was well known. So um, what it is you've got in that central kind of bench-like throne, you've got Augustus and Roma sharing a throne together. But over at the right, what you've got is the next emperor, Tiberius, stepping out of his chariot. And the chariot is being driven by Nike, the goddess of military victory. She's always the winged goddess. You always recognize her, even though um, sometimes we think it's more like the Hallmark Angels. But no, Nike is um, a military goddess, and she's pr portrayed as winged. But what I want to talk about is these figures over here on this side. This figure reclining here is gay, or earth. That remember, in Greek and Hebrew, all nouns have a gender, masculine, feminine, or neuter. And so when you personify a noun, be it a lectern or a table, <laughs> you would personify it as a person of that gender. But it's grammatical gender. It doesn't have anything to do with anything more than that. So earth, because it's hey gay, is personified as a woman and the symbol of fertility, this little kid. Behind and she and you can always recognize her from the cornucopia. She holds a cornucopia, symbol of abundance. Behind her is the ocean, and behind him is the figure that classic scholars think is Oikumene, that is the whole inhabited world. And that figure then is putting the crown on Augustus's head. So in Rome's vision of itself, the whole world, including all peoples of the world and all oceans and continents of the world adore Roman imperial world uh, rule. In fact, Oikumene crowns Roman rule and blesses it and says, this is great and wonderful. But what's interesting about the Gemma Augustea is it's an upstairs, downstairs kind of cameo. And in the downstairs, you can see that the whole system is propped up by endless military conquest and violence. And they knew this. The Romans knew that the way their system works, this Roma Eterna, this blessed eternal empire is by conquering more and more people, enslaving peoples and nations. So those enslaved figures with their hands tied up are not just individual captives, which of course was the case, but they represent whole conquered nations and they're being tortured. And Rome is advertising no um, point in trying to resist Roman imperial rule or conquest because this is what's going to happen to you. Um, and it was indeed the case. Oh, here's a detail of the bottom one. Okay, and then this is um, the next iteration. This is called the Great Cameo of France. This is now when Tiberius himself is the emperor. What you see here is it's a three-tiered cameo because now Augustus is up in heaven sort of directing and watching over the whole thing. Tiberius is ruling, but again, you've got this scene on the bottom. What props the whole thing up is endless conquest and captivity. And you see this on Roman coins also. Here's one that says to the divine Caesar, and the emperor's got his foot on the globe in subjugating the whole globe. They, interestingly, in the ancient world, knew the world was round, but that wasn't just an interesting geographical fact. That was conquest information. You subdue the whole globe, then. That's your goal. Um, these are just a few more scenes of conquest. I've got to watch the time here. Um, this is in a an monument near where Revelation was written. Um, in Aphrodisias in Turkey, but right around the time of the mid-first century, showing Augustus again being adored by, even though it's sort of eroded, you can see Earth on the left with that cornucopia, not so easy to see, an ocean on the right. So they really thought that the whole world adored 
Roman rule. And, it, and Augustus here is even pictured with the rainbow around his head, which is an image al used also in Revelation. This is um, Claudius conquering Britain. They have to personify nations, then also ethnos as a feminine figure because they are feminine grammatical nouns. So conquering starts to look like rape scene. Um, oh, here's a scene. This is from the Column of Trajan. Sorry, I had them out of order. This is the spiraling motifs. It's incredibly beautiful carving, but it just shows this eschatological vision of how Trajan's conquest of Dacia is going upwards and around and around, world without end, meaning empire without end. I'm going to skip over some of these. So what's important and what Dieter Georgi argued in that article, this is the Arch of Titus in Rome where after the conquest of Jerusalem they're advertising the endless um, conquering here. And finally here's a slide of Nike, that goddess of Roman imperial victory. What Georgi argued is it's against all this Roman imperial eschatological propaganda. Rome's creed of itself as eternal and omnipotent it's against that that Jesus and the communities he gathered together in Galilee and in ancient Palestine, Israel, Jesus says a no to this whole system. Jesus says it's unjust, it's killing people, it's making the world sick and the peoples of the world sick. And moreover, the eschatology is wrong. Only God is eternal. Rome should not be worshiped. Rome is not eternal. Even though Roman propaganda argues that the whole world gazes adoringly at conquest and rule, the New Testament authors, the Apostle Paul, others, certainly the book of Revelation, but most of the others as well, in one way or another, say no to Rome's claim of being omnipotent and eternal. So then the question is, how can this help us for ecology today? What aspects of this this counter-imperial reading of the New Testament then could contribute to an ecological reading. And I'm just going to do that with Revelation and frame it in terms of eco-reformation. Because um, I think this is an important question. Last year, 2017, was the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the Wittenberg Castle church door, if indeed he did that. <laughs> But as you all know, who are Methodists or Calvinists and, and Lutherans, the Reformation went on a lot longer than that. So we've got 40 more years of Luther's life that we can keep celebrating Reformation if you want to, and all the other Reformers. But if we broaden it more to ask what needs reforming in our world today, I mean, I think that's the question we need to ask about Reformation, not just what did they do 500 years ago, but take the idea of Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, that is the church always being reformed, and ask what in our lives, in our world needs reforming today. And certainly I would say the way we view the world as a kind of place where we can um, put our garbage endlessly and endlessly. The, the way we think that endless growth is the solution to everything. This is what needs reforming and this is what the Bible can help us with. Okay, so I'm gonna make seven points. I can tell I'm gonna run out of time, but that's great. When you work on Revelation, you know, time's up, the end is here, so okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so here are my seven main points, and then we'll see if I could get through any or uh, none of them. Um, it's, let me see what my next slides are. Okay, oh, Tree of Life, I'm gonna get to that. Okay, so first point, contrary to fundamentalist claims, Revelation does not culminate in any so-called rapture nor does anyone go up to heaven, nor is the battle of Armageddon being fought. Rather, Revelation culminates in what I call a so, sort of rapture in reverse. That is, instead of people going up, escaping from the earth, it's God who descends. And this is quite remarkable, because this is a place, Revelation is deeply rooted in traditional Jewish apocalyptic traditions, but this idea of God coming down and God's throne being in the middle of the renewed city in a profoundly beautiful garden world. That's unique to Revelation. It's God who you could say is raptured down, if you want to use that word rapture, which I don't like to. Um, okay, second, a strong sense of an impending end pervades the entire book of Revelation. You've probably heard that it's about the end times. I mean, that is true. There's that sense of an impending end. 
but the crucial thing is that it's not primarily about the end of the earth, the created world, what is created in Genesis. Rather, in Ro Revelation envisions an end to the Roman imperial order of impression, of oppression and in injustice. So that's what I think is key to New Testament eschatology. It's not about the end of the world. God is not planning to blow up planet Earth and create a new one. It's rather about the end of empire, the end of an unjust system. And, and the end is very near, Revelation says, to give people hope. But we have to be careful about what's envisioned as coming to an end. Third, Revelation draws its roots deeply from Jewish apocalyptic tradition. And when I was in seminary, we learned this big distinction between apocalyptic and prophetic. We thought the prophets, you know, Jeremiah, Isaiah, they care about the world. They see hope for the world. But apocalypticists like Daniel, they've just given up. They're escapists. They see the only um, solution that's coming from heaven, from God. And they're um, not engaged. But new work by um, Hebrew Bible scholar Thea Poitier Young, even John Collins now, certainly Richard Horsley, um, a new book by Micah Teal, I thought I brought it, called, here it is, Apocalyptic Ecology Takes Us Into Revelation. All of these are arguing that apocalypses are in fact very engaged. They might use sort of mythological imagery, but they're quite political and they're helping, helping us envision the end of empire. Um, fourth point, the plagues of ecological destruction in Revelation, which, let's admit it, that's the hardest thing. There's these series of the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. They're all terrible. What I'm going to argue is they are telling the story of Exodus, retelling the story of Exodus. So it's a story of liberation. And the, the book of the Bible that most deeply shapes Revelation, I mean, what's weird about Revelation is it might have as many as 1,000 quotes of Scripture but it never introduces them with quote marks, which didn't exist in the ancient world, but it never even says, like, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, nothing. He's just um, alluding all the time to scripture. He's deeply steeped in scripture, and he just has, like, phrases and words and everything coming um, right out of the Hebrew Bible. And probably the book that is most important for influencing the story of Revelation is Exodus. And I then would argue that the key verse of Revelation is chapter 18, verse 4, come out, my people. John is directly addressing the audience at that moment, saying, come out of Babylon, come out of Rome, and be part of New Jerusalem. We'll talk about that. But the Exodus story then can help us understand the plagues. Because, of course, you've got the plagues in Exodus as sim signs to try to get Pharaoh to let my people go. And um, they, all, they, too, are sort of ecological disasters. Okay, five. I'm going to write five more minutes. How's that? <laughs> in Revelation, there are frequent statements of woe that seem to be curses against the earth. But I would argue the intent of these statements of woe, it's the Greek word uai, um, is not predictive but rather lament. That God is sad about what's happened to the earth. God is lamenting on behalf of the devastated world. So I would translate these as alas. Um, it's, it's hard to know what's a good translation in English. I mean, the, the New Jerusalem Bible uses the word mourn. The common English Bible, I can't remember what it uses. I think it's, um, it's not woe. But anyway, it's really hard to translate this. But I think we need to think of God as lamenting on behalf of the earth, not as pronouncing woes against the earth. Six, Revelation gives voice to all creation, to all the other creatures. It's not just people who get to sing praise to God in Revelation. It's earthworms. It's animals. It's living creatures. Um, and it's very striking in Revelation. The animals also have souls. The creatures in the sea in chapter 8 have psychi, have souls. And this is a, the case also in the Hebrew Bible, of course. Living creatures have souls. But it's really important that the whole world participates in the liberation that is happening, that God is inaugurating. And seventh, in terms of ethics, Revelation affirms an ethic of healing and renewal for this world, not an ethic of escape from this world. In the choice between two cities, communities of God's followers are called to give testimony and resistance. And it's this urgent vision of hope and resistance, I think, that can help us today. Okay, I'm going to skip a whole section here and just get to that. Um, 
let me just say, the ecological aspects of Roman imperialism, I got from Robert Hughes, I get from Dieter Georgi, but also another one of your emeriti, Robert Jewett, has been very important in his commentary on Rome, Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, he lifts up some of this. So I just want to thank him that, um, that we see how Paul's understanding in Romans 8, um, and I think we could apply this also to Revelation, might reveal a pretty sophisticated understanding of what Rome was doing to the environment, as well as, of course, to people. So this vision of healing for the world, how can we draw on this as a vision of hope for our world today on earth as in heaven? Here what I do is draw on that choice between two cities at the end of the book of Revelation. The contrasting future visions, and you could say the two contrasting eschatologies. What's so great about the book of Revelation, like so many of the Hebrew Bible prophets, is it gives us a very astute critique of the evils of empire. I mean, chapters 17 and 18, especially chapter 18, is an economic critique set in the frame or the, the genre of a funeral service performed in advance. And this is absolutely brilliant. You see it in the Hebrew Bible in Isaiah 14, for example, a funeral for the king of Babylon while well, he's still alive. Now, this is something you probably don't want to try in your parishes. <laughs> don't do somebody's funeral while they're still alive. But the effect of it then is to help people see that the, the death of this system, the death of this evil king is already underway. And that's what John does in chapter 18 of Revelation. He gives us this threefold funeral liturgy that is these dirges. So it's got satirical laments, basically, alas, alas, for Babylon, the great city. It's the dirge pronounced by the kings of the world about their city, the Roman Empire, which is going down. Then it's the dirge of the merchants of the Roman Empire, and then it's the dirge of the seafarers, the, the ship traders. And the central one, the lament of the merchants, has this incredible list of all the cargoes that are being carried on the merchant ships that they're trading. And the list of the cargoes includes forests, um, logging, I mean, it's, it's grain, it's animals, and then the last two items are people, that is human bodies, that is slaves. This is one of the few places in the New Testament that we see a really important critique of the slave trading economy in the ancient world. And John of Patmos is pronouncing a funeral liturgy for the whole thing, the dirge that is the end of this unjust empire. So other biblical authors do that kind of thing, critiquing empire. What's so great about Revelation, though, so that's the one trajectory. The, no, I guess I was doing it is this one. The possible future trajectory the Roman Empire is on is dangerous. It's not sustainable, it's unjust. John is showing us this scenario, and I argue that all those plagues in the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are part of this as well. He's unveiling, he's pulling back the curtain, that's what the word apocalypse means, to show people how evil and dangerous the Roman imperial system is. And then he's saying, come out of that, my people. Get off of that train, come out, lest you take part in its sins, lest you share in its plagues. But what Revelation does that is so important for us is give us the other future scenario. And that's the New Jerusalem vision of chapters 21 and 22. It's in every way, it's the opposite of that Babylon vision. He'll show some of the same things, but then change them, transform them. So the, the pearls that were in the, uh, the jewelry on the whore of Babylon. I mean, I don't like the way Revelation uses feminine imagery. Let's just say he's terribly misogynistic. It's awful the way he personifies the Roman Empire as a woman, as a whore. It's very dangerous for women. But some of that same imagery, the way then he's got it in a completely different way in the New Jerusalem, the pearls become the gates of the city, and they're always open, and everyone has access. So John is showing us this contrasting vision of God's holy city, the city that is coming down out of heaven from God, and God declares, this is my home with all the peoples of the world. My home now is on earth. My dwelling place is on earth. And then the invitation is to everyone who had no access to all those cargoes in Babylon. I mean, they didn't have money to buy enough food, to buy anything. 
the declaration in Revelation over and over is that let everyone who thirsts come. Let anyone who desires take the water of life without cost. The Greek word dorian means you don't have to pay any money. It's available for everyone. Water is a right, a human right. Everyone has access to the water of life. And the image then of the tree of life, I've got some wonderful pictures of the tree of life that I'll just show, because I'm working more and more with this image. This is a mosaic in the church of San Clemente in Rome. I, I just love the way the, the cross of Jesus becomes this tree of life. The deer at the bottom are drinking out of the water of life that comes out of it. And then it spirals out into these viney tendrils. And what's amazing is that up in those viney tendrils are scenes of village life, like a woman is feeding chickens, or a man is, um, I think he's sharpening a knife, I forget, somebody's gathering food into baskets. So again, it's that invitation, like the icon I passed around, to see yourselves as part of God's tree of life, to see this as an alternative vision of political economy that includes us all. And the, here's the shaker tree of life, um, here's an African Jesus as a kind of tree, um, the Tree of Life also is wonderful because Charles Darwin used it to image the community of relationships in which we're all connected to one another. And I think that's the best aspect of the Tree of Life, is to see it as an image of community. This is um, the second most recent Tree of Life. You know, scientists keep discovering more new genes, and now they're imaging the Tree of Life like this, a little bit more like Darwin did, except we're way down here at the bottom with all the other eukaryotes. But it's wonderful. Science is absolutely wonderful, the way new discoveries are always being made, and we're all part of the Tree of Life in this community of relationships. So this one, what this image of the Tree of Life is doing is showing the relationships across the circle among all different genetic types and how we truly are so related to one another. And here's a picture of the Tree of Life that I really like from the Lutheran Retreat Center in the Cascade Mountains, Holden Village. So what's hard for an artist to depict is how the river of life can flow right through the middle, but the tree has to be on either side. John is taking, when he's constructing this image of Revelation 22, he's constructing it out of the Garden of Eden where there's the Tree of Life, and he knows there's one Tree of Life. But he's also drawing from Ezekiel 47, where it's on both sides of the river, because he wants to use Ezekiel, because that's where he gets the idea that the leaves are for healing. And that's perhaps the most important thing for our world today, is how do we begin to envision the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of our world? Our world is ill. We are ill. It's an urgent illness, but it's not the sickness unto death. And this is, I think, where the wake-up call of the Bible, the vision of hope of an alternative future that is beautiful, that is life-giving, that is open to all, this is what we need to embrace and follow. This is what we're invited into. Um, I'll just lift up a couple other authors, and then I'll stop. As we think about this image of the Tree of Life, one of my favorites is this Kenyan author, Wangari Maathai, who founded the Green Belt Movement and won the no Nobel Peace Prize for it. She's undertaken a campaign of tree planting, hundreds of thousands of trees, maybe millions of trees, and she writes about how this is motivated by the biblical vision of the Tree of Life. And then Pope Francis. I hope that, I'm sure you're using this, but um, I would say Pope Francis is the Martin Luther of today or the John Wesley of today. He's amazing in the way he's lifted up environmental justice and other concerns and made these urgent calls. Certainly also the Greek Orthodox patriarch Bartholomew and um, Pope Francis and Bartholomew, he's sometimes called the Green Patriarch, um, together issued a statement for September 1 that I think we need to listen to again this September 1 and it comes around about the urgency of observing a season of creation in our lives as churches, as communities of faith, where we really change course because this is what Bartholomew calls a kairos moment. It's an urgent moment in time. We don't have that much longer. So we've got to galvanize the imaginations of all our communities. That's what Pope Francis did with this wonderful encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home. And that's what I think we can do as proponents of eco-reformation. Thank you. So rich uh, and provocative and evocative and
so many wonderful ways. Uh, so we only have four minutes left. <laughs> We've got, we've got about four minutes left. Uh, Sorry. Also note that we will be joining, uh, for those who are available, you can please come over to Loader uh, to the private dining room for lunch from 1230 to 130 to continue conversation. But briefly, uh, what questions uh, do we have? Uh, oh, yeah, Phil, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. This was delightful. Uh, the pictures are just wonderful. And uh, the entire expo was inspiring. I have uh, one of the observations for you in response to what I assume was going on. Biblical story starts in a garden and it ends with a city. And the city is really foregrounded, as you point out. And then the, the garden uh, finds its new home in the city at the end. So salvation uh, is in a, in a very urban way, and the author seems to have it kind of urban. And it is a urban bio. Now, many utopias uh, move in a different direction, they, they move away from city, they move to a pastoral kind of uh -huh. vision of the future. It's really quite striking that the city is the, the, the new cradle of uh, the primordial garden. How have you thought of eliciting your insights about that? Well, I think it is really important to care for our cities. I mean, um, and Georgi said that already is one of the moves that John makes that's different from Roman kind of idyllic ecology or eschatology that still had people kind of going back to the country in the, you know, odes, uh, Carmen Seclari and Horace's hymns and stuff. No, I think that the, the centrality of cities in our lives and our world, it's, it's there. I mean, in Revelation, it's the word polis. He's, he's definitely calling it a city. And, um, you know, not that rural ministry and rural economies aren't also really, really important. They are. But the, the vision of having green space in a city and seeing our salvation as being in community with others, I think, is, um, is profoundly urban. In, in, um, in this text. Now, it's, of course, Revelation isn't the only text. In fact, I wouldn't say it's the central text in the Bible or anything. Um, the Gospels are more agrarian as is the Hebrew Bible. But certainly Paul thinks when he's evangelized cities, he's evangelized the whole world. He's very urban-oriented. So one can make a case um, for the city. Uh-huh. Yes. I'm not sure even if I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, if you, I mean, look at, look at two books of John Bateson today, and uh, four of which are kind of like pictures from angels. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. I Thank you. I just was um, looking at one of Amos Wilder's books of poetry, because he was a New Testament scholar, very preeminent, and also a poet. And maybe that is a calling that some of us need to follow as theologians, is to try to do that. Now, I'm not any good at it but it's yes because what we're trying to help people do is imagine and, and imagine differently from um, the propaganda and images of our time I hope theologians will have a role but we might need to do more poetry than we've been um, planning on thank you uh-huh Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the the idea of co-creators has been somewhat controversial. I mean, Philip Hefner at LSTC uses the word created co-creators, but some don't even want to give that much agency to people. But I think I think it, it can be a wonderful image if you also say that Earth and the oceans are co-creators. So yes, and the generosity and the gestational idea, I love that image. Thank you. 
There's a, I mean, Revelation 12, if you want to see a pregnant woman to beat all, uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the image of um, Jesus is born from the people of God. So she's in labor pains. And it's, I think it, the labor pains can actually be a really important image for us as we think about the transition to a carbon free economy. I mean, there could be pain involved in it, certainly, but it's the, the pain of hope, of giving birth to a new economy that, um, that ends in joy. So the, the labor pains image is used a lot in the Bible, but it's a, it's a sim so it's a symbol of the agony of the transformation, but it's also used as a sign of hope. And I think that's a great image, too. But yeah, read Revelation 12 if you want a pregnant woman. And Luther loved, Luther loved that chapter. So I even wrote a hymn about her as the church. So yeah, he, he was uh, really into Revelation 12. Maybe one more question before we close. Well, that was also a wonderful event. So many thanks again. Uh, thank you. Feel free to join us.